We are live again for another interview. This one is a special one. We have a legend on today. Some of you guys know him, Jared Casaza. A um, couple different websites that he has. I'll talk about that you know, in a few minutes. I'm really excited about this one because Jared's a great guy. I love hearing his story. Every time I, I hear him tell, it's like awesome. We need to get this out to more people. Um, but in terms of our interviews, for those of you that have watched them, I think this is the fifth one now. We've had like three people talk about paying down their loans. We've had another one talk about public service loan forgiveness. Jared is pursuing uh, regular loan forgiveness uh, for income generating payment plans. So he's going to be the first one really to to talk about that plan and also how to how to master it and dominate it. And just listening from his experience, it's awesome for us because we talk about this stuff on the phone with people all the time. And you might be watching this and, and you've heard us talk. We've talked to you about it. Jerry's actually lived it the last seven years. Okay. So it is awesome to, to see him, uh, to, you know, and hear his story because it's like, wow, if I'm doing that, I can actually do that. That is a real thing. It's just not somebody telling me this stuff. So without further ado, Jerry Casaza, welcome. Uh, thank you very much for having me. Um, so a little bit about myself. I was a, I graduated 2015. Um, and I've been a travel therapist for four and a half years now, traveling with my girlfriend, um, Whitney. And uh, we've traveled all around the East Coast, taking contracts for about the first three years. I worked pretty much nonstop and uh, saved a ton of money. And then this past two years, I've been doing uh, what I call like a semi-retirement thing. where I, uh, <laughs> I'm just working like one or two contracts and then doing a lot of international travel and working on other projects and websites. Um, so I, I've got the Fifth Wheel PT website where I write a lot about finance and then also a new website we have is Travel Therapy Mentor where we've been helping a lot of new uh, therapists get started with travel. Yep. So for those of you that don't know about Jared's, you know, Fifth Wheel PT, I mean, that's, that's how I got to know Jared it was, was from that website. Um, you know, before we even get to that, though, you went to PT school. First of all, let's just start there. Why did you go to PT school? How did you choose a school you went to? Um, and then from there, what really got you started looking into just money in general? What, like, what sparked that interest? Uh, so PT school, I was not a traditional PT student at all. I kind of just fell into it, honestly. I, um, I went to a community college because I had no idea what I wanted to do. So I was there for three years. And uh, during that time, I got really into lifting. And I was like, hey, I could just be a personal trainer. And then I started looking up salaries for personal trainers and it's not that great. So then I was like, okay, so what could I do with a fitness background um, with a little more education, maybe make some more money. And that's honestly how I chose PT. And, uh, and I was probably the laziest student. So um, I remember graduating in um, undergrad and I was planning to take a year off of school and uh, probably, uh, I don't know if I even would have gone back. And my mom was like, no, you can't do that. You have to apply. So uh, I actually applied to PT school late, applied to one school, and got in and just uh, things worked out okay for me. But, uh, but I got very lucky because it could have uh, gone down a very different path. And um, as far as finances go, I've always been like a, I guess, a natural saver. But it was my senior year or my, I guess my last year of PT school where I really got into um, deep into finances and uh, learning about personal finance. And, and since then, I've, I've read over 100 personal finance books and um, I'm involved in a lot of forums and write articles on it. So I've... Uh, I've kind of been just really self-taught and it's, it's, I don't know why, but I just have a passion for personal finance and investing. Yep. Yeah. Same way I, I am. I mean, everybody, I, I have a finance degree and everybody's like, Oh, you know, money because you went to, you know, got your degree in finance. Honestly, all the stuff that I learned was from books that I read before I ever went to college. Like yeah. college kind of, to me, just a waste of time. It's like, what, what, what the hell is this? Like finance stuff, like invest this way. It's like, yeah, I read that when I was 14. Like, what, yeah. like it's in a book. Why am I paying so much money for this? Like yeah, ridiculous. Well, you know, as you know, a lot of it is just basics. I mean, yep. um, it doesn't have to be that complicated. Of course, you can add complexity and make things more complicated as you learn more. But the basics are pretty simple. Yep. And some of you that are, are watching this, you've seen our workshops. Like we just released our courses this week. And, and you've already seen that like, if you bought that and you lost, uh, watched level one, like the first ones, that's like the first thing we say. Keep it simple. Yeah. <laughs> like this stuff doesn't have to be that complicated. Just keep it as simple as possible. Um, travel PT, you went the travel route. Yeah. Um, some people watching this, they don't not know what travel is. Um, you know, explain what that is. How did you even decide to start looking into that? What was the big decision maker for you to say, Hey, I, I am going that route instead of the traditional nine to five PT route. Just explain that decision and going, going down that path. 
Um, so basically travel PT is just uh, short term contracts, usually three months at a time um, all around the United States. And uh, so employer, like the facility itself would need a traveler for things like maternity leave or if they're trying to hire somebody permanent and they can't find somebody or um, for short term disability, those kind of things. And then the traveler, the reason that we would want to travel is because you make more money and you also get to explore the country. So um, those are the two big things. And, and obviously it's not for everybody because if you have a family, it makes it very difficult. But, uh, you know, me and Whitney graduating at the same time and uh, not having a family, it was uh, the perfect path for us. And I think it was my first year I had a clinical where I met a travel therapist and I asked him a bunch of questions. And one of the questions was, well, how much do you make traveling? And he told me, and that's, that's when I was sold on. I was like, all right, well, I'll just do that for a few years. My original plan was to pay off my loans completely, buy five rental properties, and then settle down. That was my plan. And then obviously things evolved over time. But, uh, <laughs> but when I heard about the pay, I was like, all right, I'm, I'm going that route. Yeah. And the big thing in that too is you get tax-free stipends. Yes. So not only is it a higher income, but half the income, most of the time for most people, about half the income you receive is not taxable. Yep. Um, so the cash flow side of things on travel is, is awesome. Yes. Um, I highly recommend it for new grads. If you're a new grad OT, new grad PT, uh, nurses, new, new grad, new nurses can't do it. They got to wait. But if you can, I mean, you can make a killing, um, especially as a new grad and, and explore, see different settings, see the country. It's awesome. And now if you're like Jared and semi-retired, you can start seeing the entire world. Like yeah. it's funny because every time I go to talk to Jared, he's like, I can't talk. I'll talk to you in a week. It's like, why? Well, like, I'm in Spain. It's like, yeah. oh, okay, okay, fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so um, as a new grad traveler, uh, we have so much interest in that now. Uh, we've had in just this past year, I think we've had over 300 new grads or third year students reach out to us on the Travel Therapy Mentor website um, asking about traveling. And the, uh, obviously the main reason is, they hear that you make more money and everyone's graduating with a ton of student loan debt. So yep. um, that, that's, everyone's looking into that now. And it's, uh, it's becoming more and more common for new grads to travel. And when we started, there was very few resources out there, which is why, um, you know, once I got a little bit of knowledge, I was like, Hey, I can make this a lot easier for other people. And, um, and w back to the pay thing, um, as a, a new grad traveler, I actually was making double uh, what several of my classmates were making and like outpatient ortho clinics in our area. So, it was kind of a no-brainer. I could go work at a outpatient ortho. Um, I, my first job was two hours away from my hometown, and make double what I could if I stayed in my hometown. So you know, why would I? Why would I do that? Absolutely, absolutely. And that actually, you brought up your, your newer website. The first website, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, was actually Fifth Wheel PT. Yeah, yeah. Those of you that don't know about that site, you know, Jared, explain what what the Fifth Wheel is all about, and, and how you even got down that route. Yeah, so uh, it was probably our, my third year of PT school when Whitney and I were really sold on traveling and we were like, okay, so moving is obviously going to be a pain to, uh, every three months. So uh, an easy way to go about that would be to buy a camper and live in that. So then we started researching campers and turns out that most campers are not made for people as tall as me. So, uh, <laughs> so we pretty much had to get a fifth wheel it was the only thing that really made sense for us. So we traveled in a fifth wheel for two and a half years and uh, that's when I started that website. And and really, I mean, I wrote about travel therapy, I write a bunch about finances, and then I write about my financial independence journey. I write a lot about finance as well. Yeah, yeah, it's funny because I, I can't tell you how many phone calls that I go to get on and someone's like, I'm thinking about getting a fifth will. And I'm like, yeah, okay, you, you, you've been to Jared's website. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. And they're like, oh, you know Jared? <laughs> Probably three or four dozen uh, other travel couples have like reached out to us and ended up starting an, either a fifth wheel or a camper because of that. Yeah, it, it's funny. I'm like, oh, yeah. They're like, oh, you know Jared? It's like, yes, I know Jared. Uh, <laughs> so good route to go. Good route to go. Now, the big question is, is did you guys sell it or did you keep it? <laughs> so we still have it. Uh, we potentially, so we, we haven't worked now since uh, I think our last job ended in May. So we might take another contract in November. And uh, we still have it. So we potentially might live in it again. We might try to sell it. We're, uh, we're kind of on the fence. It's in storage right now. So Yeah, good stuff. Good stuff. Well, that is exciting. So one of the big things that uh, Jared touched on, and I touched on this in the very beginning, the reason why I was so excited about having Jared on is because he is on an income driven repayment plan, loan forgiveness plan, whatever you want to call it. Um, and he, he's doing everything exactly what you're supposed to do. Now, 
a lot of you have heard us in either workshops or on the phone, and we tell you that there's a lot of, quote, risk in those plans. And the key thing is that you have to prepare for the tax at the end of it. And we will give you a recommended minimum amount to save. And we have a solution. You guys all know about that already that tracks to make sure you're doing it correctly. And we say, here's the recommended minimum amount. But to really, really get ahead of this thing, you want to save as much as you can, as early as you can, especially when you're young, before you have a lot of other obligations like getting married and kids and a house payment and all stuff. You really want to save as much as you can just in case something happens. Okay. Jared's living proof of that. Okay. So Jared, go ahead and you know share your story about one, why did you switch to the loan forgiveness strategy from a payoff strategy? What changed in that mindset? And then just talk about your strategy of saving, how much you saved and, and so on and so forth. Yeah. I just want to say first that, uh, I really wish that FitBucks had been around five years ago because <laughs> I cannot tell you, I, I'm not kidding, two weeks before graduation. So we took board exam and then I had nothing until graduation. I spent that solid two weeks trying to decide what I was going to do with my loans, if I was just going to pay them off or if it made more sense to invest. And I went back and forth and back and forth. I ran all the calculations and that your website would have made it so much easier because uh, uh, that was a, a kind of a stressful time. So like I said, I was dead set on paying off my loans as quickly as possible. And then I started looking at investment returns, right? Obviously, uh, what I'm about to talk about is not for everybody. This is, uh, you know, travel, travel therapy is a, a unique situation. Um, but anyway, so I started looking at the travel therapy. Uh, like Joe mentioned, the, uh, the basically your taxable income is very low as a traveler, which means that I can get my, my income-based payment very low as well. And the great thing about that is on the replay plan, the half of that interest is subsidized each month. So if I can get my payment low enough and it's possible as a traveler, especially if you contribute to um, a 401k and things to get your payment down to zero. So what that means is that basically your effective tax rate is cut in half. So my, uh, my average tax or my, uh, sorry. Uh, yeah. My interest rate, not tax rate. Sorry. My interest rate right now is my average is about 6%. So if I get my, uh, my payment down to zero, that drops it down to 3%. And, uh, I wouldn't try to beat a 6% return in the market, but I will all day try to beat a 3% return in the market, right? Yep. So I decided at that point, like I ran all the calculations, okay, um, if I just, basically my loans are accumulating at 3%, I'm pretty confident I can beat that over the long-term investing. And the great thing about that is that's assuming that there is no forgiveness, right? If that's assuming that it never happens, I'm still confident I can beat that. But if it does happen, then obviously I'm even in a better shape, right? So I, I felt that that was like a, almost like a double fail safe, right? So that's how I decided to do that. And, um, and so far it's worked out really well. And uh, I wrote an article last year, or maybe it was earlier this year. And in the first three and a half years, I'm, my net worth compared to if I had paid off the loans right away is about $20,000 higher by investing. And yep. obviously part of that's luck. No one knows what the market's going to do. Um, but it has been good over the last three and a half years. So I'm way, way ahead. So that means even if the future years are not as great, I'm still, I have a huge buffer already at this point. Yeah. And the cool part is now, not only do you have enough save for the tax liability, but if Jerry really wanted to, and you can correct me if I'm wrong again, but if Jerry really wanted to, if he really wanted to pay off his student loans, he could take <laughs> not all the money that he saved, he could take some of it and write a check and pay off his loans. That's how much money he's been able to save. Yeah. So my yeah. original balance, so it's been four and a half years, almost exactly since I graduated. And in that time, um, due to saving and as well as best investment returns during that time, uh, I'm at about four times my, my original starting balance, which was, um, it was, a, it was a little bit, it was right around $90,000 from my starting balance. So, mm -hmm. um, so I mean, yeah, I, I could easily just sell some equities and, and, uh, pay off my loans if I wanted. And honestly, I've gone back and forth on that over the years, but, uh, it just doesn't make sense to do it. Uh, I can keep that 3% interest rate as long as I'm traveling. I can keep trying to beat that return. And then I can hope for forgiveness in the future. If it doesn't happen, then I'll just write a check and pay it off. Yep. And that's what we talk about a lot is, is managing risk. I literally just did like a, a live Q&A for our, our course section and, and talk like for 15 or 20 minutes about managing risk and your return will be there. Yeah. Jared is the perfect example of that. He looked at the income driven repayment plan, understood the risks of it, said, how do I mitigate those risks? And a lot of times we say, when you do that and you mitigate those risks, your returns are going to be there. Not only that, 
but you're going to find opportunities that other people oftentimes overlook because they're like, well, that's too risky. But now that you lowered the risk, the return is, is more than justifying it. And as long as you understand that and you're comfortable implementing that plan, that's the key thing. Yeah. Okay. And even honestly, even more so than just uh, even if I wasn't ahead at all, let's say that I was exactly on, on track with where I would have been if I had paid off the loans. I have so much more flexibility having basically an extra $90,000 in my investment account than I would had I just paid that off. Right. So if I like like Joe was talking about, I we've taken uh, five months off last year to travel internationally and then four months off this year to travel internationally. So I would not feel comfortable doing that kind of thing if I didn't have that money invested and growing on my on my behalf, basically. Um, yep. If I just use that to pay off debt, obviously, I'd still have some money saved, but I wouldn't feel comfortable drawing down that amount of money um, if I paid off the debts, the debt right away. So I have a lot more flexibility than I would have otherwise. Yeah, I mean, Jerry, I mean, you could even you can even say, look, I want to get rid of this risk completely. I mean, the, the tax liability money that you're going to owe, if you even want to take it to the nth degree, you could just say, hey, look, that money I'm going to take out of the stock market and I'm just going to put it in some fixed income type of vehicle that's paying me two and a half or three percent and let it sit there for the next X years and then pay it. Yeah. You have so much flexibility because of the strategy. You can do whatever you want to. Yeah. It's like, it's, it's phenomenal and it's awesome to actually – you know, because I talk about this stuff, our FitBus coaches talk about this stuff so much with new grads saying, if you guys do this, this is what will happen over time. But to see it actually implemented and done, it's like, yeah. holy cow, like, you know, yeah, this I mean, be really taken advantage of. I guess there's still 20 years. Uh, I don't know if you've ever talked to people about this, but I actually considered uh, around 19 years from now, say forgiveness is still on the table extending it out another 20 years and just keep that 3% interest loan all the way, you know, for, so basically, you know, if you got to 24 years on repay and then you refinanced or not refinanced, sorry, you consolidated, that would be a new loan and you'd have another 25 years, which I thought about doing because I mean, a 3% interest rate, I'm, I'm willing to take 3% uh, loan all day. So, but who knows what the future will be like. Yeah. The key thing there is that repay has got to still be available because exactly, it's considered yeah. a brand new loan. So who knows what's going to be available then? But yeah, no, you're absolutely right. If it's there, you know, people ask me all the time, like when I graduated, I graduated in 2005, my interest rates were 1.76%. Yeah. And so people are always like, you know, they hear me say, I hate debt, you know, I'll pay it off as fast as possible. And they're like, well, how fast did you pay yours off? I paid mine off as slow as I could because 1.76%, yeah. I don't want to pay that off. Yeah, keep that forever. Yeah, but that also brings up a key. Like I say all the time, get rid of your debt. What Jared is doing is getting rid of his debt. What I mean by that is first and foremost, he has enough save for the tax liability within just a few years of graduating debt. And when you have an income during repayment plan, that is your debt. It's not the balance that you owe. It's the tax that you're going to owe. Yeah. And Jerry's already saved for that. So in essence, he has hypothetically paid off his debt because when the IRS knocks on the door, he's already got the money. He just, yeah. he just can't pay it right now. He's got to wait 20 or 25 years until they knock on his door and say, we want our money now. But yeah. the cool part is now he can let that money sit there and grow for him and then say, here's a little bit of that growth. Like yeah. I get to keep the rest of it. Yeah, that's uh, that's a really weird thing about um, traveling and having such a low taxable income is it's almost like paying down my debt would actually increase my risk because um, having a zero dollar payment, I, I don't really have any risk. I, I I can if I work half the year right now and those are travel assignments that my taxable income is so low, I have a zero dollar payment yep. and the interest is only accruing at three percent. Right. But that $0 payment, I could have that theoretically for the next 20 years. So what risk do I have except for the taxes at the end, right? So yeah, as long as I've saved for that, it's almost like it would be a uh, increase my risk if I paid off the debt, which is a really weird, weird thing. But that's what happens when you have government involved in loans and you have these <laughs> programs. And... Oh, that, that's like a whole nother live chat. You don't even want me to go down that yeah, route. We, um, we're actually putting together a schedule of like live chats and podcasts and all that stuff. And one of them is going to be about in depth, I, a lot of people have heard me say this, that I believe student loans is basically double taxation. And so, yeah, that's going to be uh, one of the topics. I want to deeper dive into what that actually means. <laughs> it's going to be an interesting next 10 years to see what happens with all of it. I mean, yeah, exactly. Um, so one big thing. So, so far, you know, I've seen this in the past, but in the interviews that we've done just over the last couple of weeks, there's one constant thing. 
Okay. And that are people that are successfully doing whatever it is, paying off debt, pursuing PSLF, saving for the tax liability. And that is that they had somebody there that was supporting them. Uh, for you, you already brought it up your girlfriend. For those of you that don't know Jared, Whitney's his girlfriend. She's right there with him doing all the stuff with the websites and traveling. And she's been on board since day one. You know, talk about how she's been instrumental in, you know, helping you stay on track and not getting diverted off into something else. And, and you know, just talk about how instrumental it is having that, that person there for you. Oh, yeah. It's, it's really nice having somebody. I mean, we're doing the exact same thing. I, I did all the calculations and figured out that it was best for me. And I said, hey, you know, this is probably best for you. You have more debt than me and it makes sense for me. So I know it makes sense for you. You make your own decision because I, I don't want to make it for you. And uh, so she decided to do the same thing. And us, us being able to go through this together and, and talk about things. And, and um, you know, we live pretty frugally. And then in addition to that, living in a fifth wheel, you can't buy a lot of unnecessary stuff. So yeah, having her support, living in a fifth wheel, um, me being pretty natural, I'm a pretty natural saver and pretty frugal naturally anyway. So um, all those things helped. But yeah, I mean, she's really, really helped support me. And also she uh, kind of talks me off the ledge sometimes in, as, as far as like um, overthinking everything and, uh, <laughs> and even trying to get me to spend money sometimes because that, that can be hard for me, believe it or not. Yeah, I, I mean, I, 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 people call me frugal all the time. I'm like, look, I'm not frugal. I just don't like stupid shit. Yeah. Like, yeah, I don't see very much value in a lot of stuff. Like, I just don't care. I didn't like, you know, my buddy wants me to go drink on Saturday night. Sorry, I just don't see the value in drinking. Like, uh, I don't gonna... really care about it. Like, I don't need a big screen TV because I never have time to watch the damn thing anyways. So yeah. why do I need it? You know, that, that type of stuff. Uh, so, yeah, I'm right there with you. I mean, if you're watching this and you're trying to find you know, motivation. First of all, that's why we do these live live chats and we're also turning them into podcast and, and YouTube videos and stuff. That's why the Fitbucks Finance Group is there is for that motivation. But more importantly, you need you need someone around you that that helps you stay on that path. One of the biggest problems we see is is, is that keeping up with the Joneses mentality that we all have friends that you look at them, you're like, wow, they're killing it. They got a Mercedes, they got a 3,600 square foot house, they got this, they got that. Truth is, they're probably just absolute financial midgets. Like they probably hit so much debt out of their eyes with no idea what they're doing, and just get about to run into a massive wall if something ever happens. That's keeping up with the Joneses. A lot of us, they start, we start seeing that. Hey, hey, hey! They had a Mercedes. My friends have a Mercedes. I need a Mercedes. No, you don't. Like, and you need that other person to sit there and tell you, no, you don't. Like you don't need that. Like, well, that's stupid. Right. Yeah. I mean, you know, my wife is the same way. So <laughs> I've learned over the years. Um, uh, well, a couple of points, I guess. Uh, one really, really great thing in terms of support is that nowadays there are so many awesome Facebook groups out there that can be your support. If you don't have anybody there, like um, there's there's a lot of great finance groups that people celebrate each other's wins. And and it helps to keep you accountable, having a, a community around like that. And uh, then the other thing is, yeah, usually the people that look the richest are, are the people that are struggling the most, except, I mean, there's, of course, it's an uh, exception, but the people usually with the, the giant houses and the expensive cars are the people that have leases and um, big mortgages. So you never know. And uh, yeah, I mean, it's always best to have flexibility, try to live below your means, um, have a lot of money saved because life is short. You never know when you might want to take a couple months off and go travel. Yeah, and those, those groups, you hit that on the head too. And they're really important because that, that positive encouragement. Uh, unfortunately, I see this a lot because I was you know, in wealth management and just financial stuff. So I see it a lot. People oftentimes, they don't want you to be successful. True. We, I, I call it crabs in a barrel. They, like if you start being successful, they want to pull you back down and not be successful because they want you to join their misery. Yeah. And so like we live in this society, you know, we also have just because of like different politicians and all that type of stuff where they just – chastise being wealthy or rich and it's like they're evil no they're, they're, they're people like you and i most of them are not evil okay yeah. and at the end of the day because of that again i'm not saying that's good or bad but at the end of the day it's like well i can't tell people what my net worth is i can't tell them how much i make and then if you try to post something online like hey look i, I did this everybody's like show off and they start just chastising you yeah and so all of a sudden it's like, okay, well, if I'm trying to get motivation for this stuff and being a group of people that are like me, 
where do I find it? And like Jared was saying, there's, there's groups online that you can find that people are actually happy for you. Yeah. You know, yeah. instead of saying like, screw you, they say, that's awesome. How'd you do it? Yeah. Because I want to take what you did and I want to do it. <laughs> that's a perfect example. Your, your friends and family, as counterintuitive as it is, usually are not the ones that, except maybe a spouse or somebody really close to you, obviously, but they're usually the ones that don't really want to see you do really well because then they have to consider that they came from similar means and they didn't do as well, right? Yeah. Um, but strangers, they don't know you at all. And they're, they're definitely willing to celebrate your wins. And, um, and that's, a, that's a really nice thing to have. And, uh, you know, before just, what, like 10 years ago, that didn't exist. So that's really helped me a lot, um, being able to see other people doing well on, on different groups and um, seeing people actually, you know, give positive feedback and stuff when I, you know, post things is really nice. Yeah, and that, it's funny because, like, when I started this stuff, there, there wasn't those groups. I mean, Facebook was just, you know, starting right around then. And, and you know, I had to get – I am I was, you know, an athlete. I'm majorly competitive. So I had to make up games in my own head <laughs> to really motivate myself. Um, but nowadays it's like, you know, like I said, when I started about two years later, Facebook was there. And to me, I never really contributed to those groups, but to me, I like seeing them cause I was so competitive. I was like, I want to beat that person. Yeah. Like, and now it's a game cause I'm going to, I'm going to beat that mother effort because I just, that's just my nature. I just like, I'm, 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 I'm going to beat you. Yeah, I'm the you same. Know, it, it, my wife's brother makes fun of me all the time. He's like, "Is everything a competition?" I'm like, "Yes, it is." Yeah. Some of you that are watching this, are like, "No, it's not." I'm like, "Yes, yes, it is." <laughs> you know, something else really interesting about uh, I don't know why there's such a stigma about actually being smart with your money. It's weird that the decisions that are, are the best for you are the decisions that are the most um, looked down upon for some reason. It's but so here's the weird thing. I always always uh, make comments about this to Whitney is that. If you see someone buy a brand new car, you know, you know, usually your friends on Facebook, you know, kind of what job they have. You probably know what range or salary is. And you see them buy a car that is probably way above what they should be buying. Everyone is like, oh, great. That's a beautiful car and all this stuff. But if you posted something about like, um, I'm now contributing a thousand dollars a month to my 401k, everybody would be like, oh, I don't want to hear about that. So it's, yeah. like, it's weird. It's the things that actually get you ahead financially are looked down upon and the things that get you behind financially are what you get praised for. And uh, I think that's like a, um, it's like a self-perpetuating cycle because you get the positive feedback and, and people crave that sometimes. So then they post these things uh, that as actually not good for them um, just to get that feedback, which is crazy. Yeah. And then, you know, you brought up cars. It's like, my dad's a huge car person. I hate cars. Right. And the last like three months, I'm like cringing because I'm, my car was a 2002 and my wife's car was a 2002 <laughs> and they worked perfectly great. They were yep. phenomenal. Her brother destroyed her car in an accident and my wife just destroyed her other car last week in an accident. And they just, just they just totaled both of them. I was like, are you oh, shit? Man. Man. Like I got to get another piece of shit, like hunk of metal to drive around. Um, but yeah, I was like, damn it. But yeah, I had that 2002 car for a long time. Obviously it was, what was that? 2002, so 17 years, and got me from point A to point B the same way as every other car, right? So, <laughs> you know, in terms of finances, uh, cars and houses, those are the big things. If you can, if you can buy a house that just fits you and in, in a decent neighborhood, and um, kind of be a little bit below your means there, and then buy a car that's five years old, they're still pretty much new, and uh, it costs 50 percent or less of the value of it new. I mean those two decisions throughout your life are massive, like million dollar decisions right there, just to get a little bit older car and a little bit smaller house will lead probably to a million dollars in net worth of your lifetime. Yeah. And like, like I mentioned the courses we just raw, we actually have a specific one of the videos talking about housing because it's so important. Actually, I actually have more than one video of that, but on that specific topic and it really stand from my experience in 2008 with the housing crisis, it's like lenders will tell you what you qualify for. That's not what you actually can afford. Yeah. Because at the end of the day, they're taking very little risk because they can always take the house. They can give a rat's ass if you get foreclosed on or not. They don't care if you can afford it. Yeah. And so we see people way over buy on houses oftentimes and they, they can't afford it. It's like, what are you doing? Yeah. Um, so yeah, yeah, that's a huge, huge thing. And, a, and you know, an awesome point on that. The, the home decision price should always be what you need 
um, you know, maybe looking five years in the future, you don't want to be buying and selling all the time if you're having a growing family, but you know, you want to look at what you need and not what you qualify for, because yeah, I mean, like you said, their risk is low. So they're willing to give you a lot more than you can really handle. And they know that they're basically, they're basically going to make your life miserable with this, this payment, but they don't care. Like what's the worst case scenario for them. They get the house back and sell it and uh, they get their money back. So um, it's you that has to, has to deal with that. Yep. And we have a question from, from someone on Facebook for you, Jared. Yep. Um, basically they're just saying, how do you feel about limiting your taxable income for the next 20 years or so in order to maintain the interest subsidy, given that you'll have to claim other revenues from investments, referrals, the side business and, and all that, that stuff. Yeah. So, um, I mean, obviously depending, I have no idea what the future will hold. I basically am taking it a year at a time. So let's say that in the future, I somehow end up making $500,000 a year and it doesn't make sense to be on uh, these, this uh, income based payment anymore. I'll just pay it off right away. So that's a problem that it could come up. It really could. Good I, problem. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's what, that's why I always look at it is like, yeah, if that happens, I'll pay it off. I'm, I'm not going to be mad about that. I'd be really excited. Like that, that's a, the best kind of problem I could have, but I'll just take it a year at a time. So as long as my income stays low and I keep my payment low and I can keep that around three to 4% interest rate, I'll keep that as long as I can. But if at some point in the future, my income's high enough that from businesses or, or whatever, um, then I would just pay it off. I mean, I, I always have the money ready to do that if I need to. Yep. And, um, one other thing, uh, actually two other things. There's always ways you can get creative with this stuff. You know, like it, it with Jared's situation, right? Like if his website's generated whatever amount of money and all this type of stuff and he starts having all these side businesses, well then you also can then turn around and start applying for SEP IRAs. Yeah. And with SEP IRAs, you can deduct a lot of money. Okay, yeah. I can't remember what the cap is, but it's like 50 grand or something like that a year. Yeah. So you can still important. shelter a lot of money. Mm -hmm. It's just a different type of account that we don't traditionally think of because we're not business, you know, we don't grow up as a business owner. Like I, I grew, I know what those are and I've known them since a long time ago because my dad's a business owner and he uses them. Another thing you can do, let's just say, okay, well that's like if you're making 80,000, $90,000 a year off a of side business revenue, then a SEP IRA could be, could be used. But what happens is if, if it is a half a million, like Jared said, where the other loopholes, then you just turn around and incorporate the business and you just don't pay yourself an income. Yeah, that's crazy. Like there, there's loopholes around that. Not only that, but it's AGI and I'd have to talk to some accounts about this, but AGI is like, okay, well, dividends, dividends are taxed as something different. So if it's not considered a part of your AGI, do you, do you have to claim all that? And now you can pay yourself a dividend instead of a wage. So there's, and, and there's no concrete way to answer that question because tax laws can change or all this stuff changes. There's ways to get creative with it. Yeah. Well, yeah. yeah. And, and the whole thing, uh, I mean, my whole plan just revolves around having the most flexibility and yeah, if I have to pay that off, I don't mind that if I have some crazy income. And honestly, my uh, my opinion on this shifts almost yearly. So you can talk to <laughs> me in, in three years and I might have completely paid them off and changed my mind. Um, but it's always going to be what I think is in my best interest, right? I'm, I'm going to, you can better believe that I'm going to put in the time to research everything and figure it out. And um, I guess the other thing is, when I, when I first started, like I said, I planned to travel and pay off my debt and get some rental properties. And then I was going to settle down and work a permanent job. Um, but what I figured out is I don't really want to work a permanent job ever. I, I'm going to travel one or two contracts a year until maybe we want to settle down, maybe have kids. And at that point, I might work PRN, but I'm not going to be working a permanent job probably ever in my life, like a full-time permanent job. So that means my taxable income, at least from PT sources, is going to always be pretty low. But that doesn't mean that um, maybe other sources I end up generating more income and, and then I'll just adjust as time goes on. Yep, exactly. And that's actually funny. One of the things you talked about, like, you know, you, you, you change your mind all the time. <laughs> I'm the same way. I mean, I, I just knee jerk, like, oh, especially when I used to do investments. Like, I actually had to institute like a cooling off period uh, yes. on my own self, like, because it's like, especially with investments, you start seeing all this news. And you're like, oh, shit, I got to do this. Yeah. So whenever I would come up with something or an idea, an investment idea, or I did evaluation, I'm like, I think this is a good investment. I'd have to do at least like a 24 like hour cooling off period to be like, okay, I got to get away from this for a minute. Let's see what happens. Well, uh, <laughs> I, I went through a phase where I, uh, I really got into value investing. I read probably, I don't know how many books I read on value investing. And then I did a bunch of research on companies and looked at the fundamentals and um, had it, I thought had it all figured out and I did pretty well with it, but here's the problem. 
it takes a lot of time. And that's all I thought about. Like I would get to work. And the first thing I want to look at is how whatever stocks I'm uh, in are doing. And I decided then that even if I could outperform the market, I'm not going to put the time in and stress myself out to do that. So then I, I was just all in on index funds from then on. Yeah. And that's, you know, I used to tell everybody, and this is a key in, in money management. There's a difference between money management and investing. Okay. Money management, you're just trying to do something that fits your plan. That's where like financial planners and stuff can come potentially come in is help you on allocation, help you set up, okay, and prioritize goals and all that type of stuff, whatever. You're trying to get up whatever return, five to eight percent per year on average over a long term. That's all you're trying to do. Investing, it's a full time job. Yeah. I mean, I, I've done it for a living. Like, like Jared said, I, I literally used to sit there and read 10 Ks and, and 10 Qs of companies for hours. I, I would read about 20 10 Ks a, a week. If you guys don't know what a 10 K is, it's an annual report for a company. That's literally like 200 pages long. And yep. then I'd go in and dump them in Excel and do modeling and, and value them. I mean, that, I, I did that for a living actually for a long time. And it's like, it is a full-time job. And I always tell people, if you're looking for investing, don't ever pay someone to do that. Do it yourself and just know it's going gonna, it's gonna to be your life. It's, it's a full-time job. Yeah. I, it's not I, this I, thing you just do. Like <laughs> I spent a, a solid year um, basically neglecting all the other things I was doing and really just focusing on valuing companies and trying to figure out uh, everything, try to get everything perfectly and, and finding my buy price for a hundred different companies and wait for them to get to that price. And, um, yeah, I mean, that's great for people that that's their full-time job. It's kind of like, um, it's kind of like people that want to have a, a small farm. It's like, I want to grow my own vegetables and have my own, uh, meat. Like that's great, but that's also another job. That's a lot of time. <laughs> so you're paying, you're paying in your time to do those kind of things. Like, um, and that's the reason that people specialize in one area because, uh, farmers do better with farming and investors do better with investing. And, and we should focus on what make us money and, uh, and, you know, either pay someone to help us or just be more broad based and uh, go that route. And know enough where you can do it yourself and understand your plan and implement it. All right. Yeah. So, but yeah, that's uh, and that's funny that you brought that up. Cause it's like, I say that to people all the time and they're like, or the other one I get, cause I mean, I know how to day trade and people are like, teach me. I'm like, no, <laughs> <laughs> First of all, it, it's hard. Second of all, it's emotional. Second of all, it's a knee-jerk reaction. Third of all, fourth of all, whatever it is, you're, you're going to be doing it. It's your life. Yeah. And so I've, I've only taught one person to day trade. And it was one of my, my, best, my best friends. And he finally convinced me to, to start pointing him down how to day trade. And he took it to the nth degree and started learning even more. And he did it for like six months. And finally, he was like, I made, a, I made decent money doing this. But now I see why you don't do it. Yeah. And it's just like, I got ADD. I can't stare at a computer screen for 15 hours a day. Like, I'm sorry. Like, I just can't. Yeah. And the returns in the long run are, are basically the same as if you just put your money in an index fund. So why yeah. am I doing that? And like, that's sad. Yeah, that's, <laughs> the, that's a sad reality. You spend all that time and then you could have just gotten probably about the same returns. Um, and then the other thing is, uh, what are the tax implications of buying and selling so much? You have short-term gains and uh, yeah, it's just, it's not worth it. I, I, for a while, I thought that I might be like an investing uh, savant and I'll just make all this money. But boy, is that not worth it. Yeah. And that's and it's a different style, too. I mean, we read all these books about diversification and all these things. That's all for money management. And like people used to ask me all the time, you know, how do you invest? I, I, I don't diversify. I don't. I used to do those valuations. I knew exactly what the value is that I'd want to enter or sell or share, sell short or whatever I want to do. And when it hit it, I'm putting a large chunk of money in it because I've done the research and I'm making money on this thing. Yeah. And people are like, well, that, you know, that's crazy. And I've even done it with Fitbooks. I mean, when I started Fitbooks, I sold all my investments and it's like my, I have, I've invested. I have one stock in one company. <laughs> Good bucks. That's it. I'm yeah, not diversified. It. I don't care. And people are like, well, traditional financial theory says diversification. I'm like, yes, that's money management. That's not yeah. investing. There's a difference, a big yeah, difference. Definitely. So, <laughs> a really big difference when you're building a business for sure. Yeah. So, and now instead of 
reading 10 Ks 18 hours a day. I work on Fitbucks 18 hours a day. <laughs> Actually, I cut it down to 16. I play with my daughter for about two or three hours a day. So <laughs> that's good. That's good. So good stuff. So Jared, you know, took up a lot of your time tonight. Thank you for coming on. It's it's been awesome. Like I said, I was really stoked about this because you, you're doing exactly what you're supposed to be doing on these loan forgiveness plans. You're the perfect example of what to do. Any closing words before uh, we uh, we finish up? Uh, let's see. I would, uh, for any students or new grads, just consider all your options. Um, I know a lot of people I talk to, maybe they're 10 years into their PT or OT career or whatever, and they're like, man, I wish I had traveled when I started because there's only a small opportunity to do that. Uh, it's usually people that are single or you know just dating. They don't have a family yet. And you have a few years that you could potentially do that. And that, that choice right there to, to make that extra money and save it. Um, I, did a, I did a presentation not long ago where I um, ran the numbers and basically, you know, 60,000 invested early in your career turns, up, turns into like 700,000 um, by the end of, you know, around retirement age. So a small choice like that, travel for a few years, save as much as you can, makes a massive difference in the long run. Even if three years in, you settle down, you have a family, you just have that money saved and invested for you or pay down debt. I mean, uh, whatever you choose to do. Um, and then I guess the other thing is just try to determine what you really value in life um, and spend money on those things. Um, because a lot of people spend money on material things that don't really give them much joy. Like uh, you might, of course, you have a, you really enjoy it the first couple of days or maybe a week that you get something new. But that newness wears off really quick and you're back to baseline. And then you're still stuck with one, figuring out what to do with that thing. And two, usually paying for it. So try to determine what in life that you really enjoy. Is it spending time with your family? Is it traveling? Is it golfing? Is it whatever it is? And try to assign your money to those things. Um, and basically just plan your life around money. Um, I, I guess that sounds weird to say, but plan your uh, plan out your life and then do and, and make your money decisions based on your plan and right. not the other way around. A lot of people will just spend all their money and then they base their lifestyle around what they can do after that. Yep. Yeah. Well, we, we, we phrase that as you want money, money to complement your life, not dictate it. Yeah, exactly. So it's identifying those goals and saying, what do I need to do with my money to actually have that complement it, not dictate it. Yes. One thing that I'll leave you guys with is Jared hit the nail on the head being a traveler. If you are going to go that route, have a game plan. You got to. I talk to so many travelers. They go because they like to travel and they make more money. They travel for two or three years. They haven't paid back any other student loans aggressively. They haven't saved aggressively. They just go and blow it. Yeah. And then they start working their nine to five job. And all of a sudden that, that extra cash flow dries up because they don't get the stipend and all that stuff anymore. And it's like, oh shit, I got all this student loan debt. I don't have any savings. And then they go back into traveling after that. Now you're three years behind. Yeah. Okay. When you, if you're going to go into travel, have a game plan. Yeah. Make sure you have that game plan so that way you're good to go and you ended up like Jared and, and being in a great situation. So well, I guess I should uh, mention too, it'd be kind of irresponsible if I didn't say. So you might make double what you make as a, a, a new grad if you chose to travel. Um, but you also have to remember that your expenses are higher as a traveler. You have two housing situations you have to pay for. And depending on how low you can get those, Sometimes that's a significant expense. Sometimes that will really eat into that uh, increased pay. So, uh, you know, I don't want it to sound like uh, that it's the best thing ever because it's not for everybody. It's certainly not the best thing ever. Um, it's just for certain people. And you have to run the numbers. You have to see how low you can get your living expenses at your, your tax home area, uh, which if you guys want to know more about that, I've got plenty of articles on that. But, um, but yeah, it, the expenses are higher. And if you're expending everything that you're making as a traveler, you're going to be in trouble because eventually you do have to settle down or most people end up settling down. And, uh, and when you do that, if you're spending all your money based on that travel pay, um, yeah, you're going to be in trouble. You're going to drop down and then uh, you're going to have to figure out how to make up that difference. Yep, exactly. So one last thing that I will touch on, because we got a question about what's the biggest disadvantage about student loan forgiveness. And then is it one to be compliant, to be qualified for it to be guaranteed to be forgiven. Go ahead. And, yeah, I'll let you answer that first way. I'll, I'll answer the second one in terms of like the guarantee and being compliant. But for you, if you did have to say, look, here's the advantages, here's the risk. We always say one of the things that to look at is disadvantages. If you had to identify from what you've seen, what is one disadvantage of, of loan forgiveness? 
Well, certainly. Um, well, there's, there's, there's several. There's uh, one that you have to recertify each year, which is uh, a pain. I mean, I would every year that I have to do that, uh, I would I think about paying off my loans and just being like, forget this. I don't want to have to worry about it. The other thing is uh, it's always in the back of your mind. Like, even though I know that mathematically I'm doing the right thing, I know that mathematically my decision makes sense. Uh, it's still in the back of my mind that I have almost 100,000 in debt. Like, man, that, that's crazy. Why am I just letting that sit there? And it's gotten better over the years, but it used to be almost weekly um, when I first started going down this route that I was like, am I really making the right decision? Is this really the right thing? Should I really just pay it off? And, um, you know, so there's always some doubt there. And then the other thing is that, of course, there's additional risk. Um, like I said, it's almost like for me that it would be a little bit more risk if I paid it off, which is weird. But there's always the risk that what if the next uh, 10 years stock market returns are negative, which happens. Um, and I'm paying my interest is accumulating at three percent and my average rate of return is negative, too. Like, that's terrible. And that can certainly happen. So there's a risk there, even though I, uh, you know, I've been lucky, lucky so far. Um, I think the average return since I graduated has been probably about 9%. So, I, you know, I've been able to um, been able to basically pocket that difference, but it could have easily been negative 3% and I would have had a 6% uh, difference to the wrong direction. So there's risk, there's, uh, there's some headache and there's constant, not constant, but there's some doubt. Yep. I don't want to touch on two things. One, I'm going to answer that other question. The other one that I'm going to touch on, just a little free financial advice for you guys, to touch on what Jared just talked about in, in investing and mitigating risk. Okay. First of all, um, to be qualified, th there's a number of different plans. So there's the income driven repayment plan bucket. Okay. The big one that people are worried about not complying on is public service loan forgiveness. That's actually a feature of regular loan forgiveness. Okay. For public service loan forgiveness, you have to work for a nonprofit. For regular loan forgiveness, it doesn't matter where you work. It's all based on your income, okay? And, and it's not like you can't dis be disqualified. It's based on when you took your loans out, what type of loans you have, and it's based on the income that you make. And that's all in your master promissory notes. So it's very easy to qualify for it. It's just you have to apply, and your lenders take about a month to do everything, but you can qualify for it, okay? The big thing on that is the tax rate at the very end. That's the big thing that you have to look at, okay? Now, Jared talked about you run the risk of the stock market, okay? For those of you that like diving deep into this stuff, I'll give you, you know, some statistics and, and some ways to mitigate that risk, okay? That actually happened from 1998 to 1999, whatever it was, through 2008 and February of 2009. If you were invested in the stock market, your return was zero. Yep. Okay. That's in price, meaning capital. And so when you start investing in the stock market, you hear the, the, the common person, and I'm just going to throw because different studies show different returns. They'll sit there and say the stock market has averaged 7% over time. Okay. And that's what they always quote. But not all investments are the same. And when you actually dig into those investments and see what that 7% is, Depending on what study you read, it's about four to five percent comes from dividends and dividend reinvestment, not from capital appreciation of stocks. People don't get that. So if you're saying, look, yeah, the stock market didn't grow necessarily that time period, but guess what? If you're invested in like an SP index fund that was giving you one and a half to three percent dividends every quarter, and you're reinvesting that at the highs and the lows and the highs and the lows, you would have still made some money because that's where the bulk of the return comes from. Yeah. So you have to be strategic about that because I hear a lot of, of young people, they go to like a financial advisor that thinks there's some effing guru or something. And they're like, you should be in small cap stocks and, and international stocks. Well, those stocks don't tend to then get, don't pay dividends. The only way you can make money on them is if you time it right and sell at the high. That's the only way you can technically make money on those. So why complicate your strategy like that? Say, this is what wealthy people do. This is how they invest. They invest with the dividends. They reinvest the dividends. Do the same thing, okay? Yep. So anyways, I like going off on that tangent because I, I hear that all the time. And it's like, this is something that, that when you have a simple understanding of that stuff, it makes sense. Yep. It's like, holy cow, there it is. So 
Yeah. Any comments on that before we close that out, Jared? Well, I'm sure you've, uh, I mean, I'm sure you've made a lot of videos about um, talking about the risks of like if student loan programs go away, but, but like you mentioned, um, it's in the master promissory note. So there is almost a 0% chance in my mind, you, you might feel differently, but there's almost a 0% chance that programs will be taken away and people in it won't be grandfathered in because basically the government would be breaching a contract if they did that. The yep. chance, I mean, that could happen, but it's very, very low. And, and also, like you mentioned, when you read all these headlines that say, like, don't rely on student loan forgiveness, you got to remember that those headlines are made to get people to click on it. Click. And they're all about <laughs> public service loan forgiveness because these programs haven't even been around 20 or 25 years yet. So there's no one that has has gone through the entire income driven repayment and gotten to forgiveness. So there's no statistics on it. It's all student loan or uh, public service loan forgiveness. And that's the one that is difficult to qualify for because it actually takes into account your employer. So, um, yeah, public service loan forgiveness, be careful. You have to be, you know, make sure your employer um, is eligible. You make sure you certify all that. Uh, what I'm doing is different. I, I don't see there any being any problem in the future. I think that it'll probably be pretty smooth. Um, I don't think there's a lot that the government could change or, or really do to make it, um, make it not viable option anymore. Yep. And like, th just to, to prove a point of what Jared was saying, it isn't a master promissory note. Whenever they've ever changed student loan stuff, they've always grandfathered in previous borrowers. Yep. The only thing that Congress has control of in these plans is the tax rate. That is it. And you can, if you think about this, okay, if you had a dollar that you had to pay to the government in 20 years, that means you can invest that dollar. And even if they taxed you at 100% of what you owed, which you guys originally, you owed that, that $1. For those 20 years, you get to keep all those dividends or that interest that you accumulated, and you only have to pay them back that $1. It's an interest-free loan at that point. And that's at a 100% yeah. tax break. Exactly. It doesn't matter. The first article I ever wrote on this, when I thought I was going to go with uh, pay as you earn, before repay was even a thing. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm old enough now that repay came out after I graduated. <laughs> but, um, but I was on pay as you earn, and I, I wrote an article about that. And what I determined is based on my income, and uh, the 20 year forgiveness, I would end up paying the same amount over a 20 year period as, as I would have paid if I did it as quick as possible. I could have paid off my loans in probably about 15 months after graduation. So why would I pay the same amount in 15 months when I could keep that loan for 20 years? Um, inflation is my friend in that situation, right? Yep. So that same $100,000, whatever it was I would have paid uh, is not worth as much over a 20 year period as it is over a 15 month period. So. Um, that was my original incentive to do it. And then repay came out and made it even, even better for me. Yep. Dollar today in your pocket is worth more than a dollar tomorrow. Yes. And that's why lenders want you to pay them back is so that way they can reinvest it and make more. Like you said, it's, you understand that mathematics, but this also is, is a very good point. Okay. That I want to bring up because I oftentimes in our workshops and stuff will say, you got to do what you feel comfortable with doing. A lot of this stuff is mathematics. And a lot of it is, is a deeper dive into how to take advantage of the income driven payment plans. If you don't understand them, you can really put yourself in a bad situation doing the wrong thing. Yeah. So make sure you understand it before you really start implicating the, the stuff that we've been talking about. You know, like Jared said in the beginning, like we have the tools to actually do some of this math for you. So if you guys need help looking at those, just let us know. And we'll show you how to use the tools. Yeah. And just make sure you understand it and that you don't do something where it's like when that you don't understand it, because that's the complete opposite in that I see all the time. People don't understand something and they go down this route and they get into trouble. Yeah. And okay, so over the years now, I, one more thing, sorry, I know we're at like an hour, yeah, uh, no problem. but over the years now I've learned that uh, I look at things very analytical, but people are, people are so different. And uh, for example, Whitney does not, everything's emotional to her. Like, as far as investing and paying down debt and all that, it's, it's an emotional decision. And that's how it is for most people I found. So I run the math and I, I come up with a plan, but your plan is only as good as your buy into the plan, right? And if you're very emotional in your decisions about money and debt, and, and what I found is that some people would just be miserable keeping debt for that long. Like they just don't want to have it. So if you're that kind of person that is emotional about it, then get rid of it. Like, even if it mathematically makes sense, just pay it off. Like, uh, there's no reason not to do that. Um, but if you're the kind of person that, that doesn't bother you as much, you can just run the numbers, which, which one has the higher probability of me coming out ahead. 
which is basically what I did, um, then, then go the mathematic route. Absolutely. So, Jared, it's fun as always. Thanks for coming on. And, yeah. you know, let everybody know the websites. If you guys want to get a, a hold of Jared, you know, what yeah. are the, the URLs? And, yeah. If you guys are interested in finance or uh, our, our personal travels, we write about our international travels and our, our domestic travels, our assignments, um, Fifth Wheel PT. That's my oldest website. And then if you're interested in traveling specifically, travel therapy, um, Travel Therapy Mentor is the, the new website that I put a lot of good information out there. Absolutely. So, Jared, thanks again. And yep. here we'll be talking to you soon. Thanks for having me. Yep.